This is Unsilo, brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. Welcome to Unsiloed. This is Greg LeBlanc, and I'm here today with Mark Woolhouse, who is a professor of infectious disease epidemiology at the University of Edinburgh. He has also been deeply involved in public health, working with the UK government and the Scottish government throughout this coronavirus pandemic of the last couple of years. Also the author of this book here, The Year the World Went Mad. Welcome, Mark. Thank you for having me. Now, I want to start by just reading a, a quote from your book. And I, I don't think I've ever read a quote from a book directly before in any of my podcasts, but it's the way you end the book. And you say, I did not expect that elementary principles of epidemiology would be misunderstood and ignored. The tried and trusted approach to public health would be pushed aside, that so many scientists would abandon their objectivity, or that plain common sense will be a casualty of the crisis. I didn't expect that the world would go mad, but it did. Now, this is rather dramatic for a, you know, an academic scientist. So maybe we can back up even before the coronavirus crisis and talk a bit about public health in general. So I think for a lot of people, the pandemic kind of arrived as something of a surprise and a shock. And I think a lot of people were unprepared for it. But epidemiologists think about this stuff, you know, all the time. I mean, in my world, my world is, is finance and, you know, we run banks through stress tests all the time and companies are always doing kind of scenario analysis and scenario planning. And so public health officials do the same thing. And epidemiologists are always thinking about these things. And you, you mentioned in the book and back in 2017, you did some work with the World Health Organization where you had to think through what the next pandemic would look like. So what do public health officials actually do in terms of scenario planning? And to what extent was what happened in 2020 something that was a surprise or a shock? And to what extent were we, did we have kind of a, a blueprint for how to respond to this? No, it, it wasn't a surprise or a shock. As you quite rightly say, the concept of emerging infectious diseases has been on public health radar for many decades now. Arguably, it started, the whole concept of emerging infectious diseases started with a report by the Institute of Medicine in the US back in the 1990s. And there's been a huge amount of work on it since. So that meeting you referred to with the WHO in Geneva in 2017, that was a list of experts in a room trying to come up with a, a set of pathogens they thought would be most likely to cause the next pandemic. So no, this is, there's been an awful lot of work for this. In addition to identifying which pathogens we ought to be worried about that might cause another pandemic, there's also been a huge amount of work on preparedness planning, going through the possibilities of what another pandemic would look like and what our response to it should be. That got a huge impetus in 2003, where if you remember, or your listeners remember, there was the SARS coronavirus outbreak centered around Asia, but it got to North America, particularly in Canada. And that really was a wake up call, I think, for many public health departments. And there's been an awful lot of work on pandemic preparedness planning ever since. Turns out, by the way, pandemic preparedness planning isn't all it might seem. In 2019, there was a study, it was called the Global Health Security Index, which rated countries, almost 200 of them, around the world on their preparedness for a pandemic such as COVID-19. And the two top countries, the US and the UK, two of the hardest hit countries in the world, particularly in that first year before vaccine rollout, 2020. And yet there we were right at the top of the list for mm. our preparations and right at the bottom of the list for how hard we were hit. So there's a, I think there's a lot of humility needed mm -hmm. in the public health and scientific community to try and understand that preparedness and vulnerability are different things. And they're different things to a virus. When we think about preparedness, do we have sort of a preparedness plan that is sensitive to differences in the infectious agent? Like, in other words, do we have a plan that's, well, you know, depending on the r naught and depending on the, you know, IFR, you know, this response should work under these circumstances, this response, or do we have sort of a one size fit all response that's insensitive to these different characteristics? In other words, to what was our response, a failure to take into consideration different characteristics of the disease, or, you know, did we actually have a plan that was sufficiently sensitive to these differences? Well, the short answer to that is over my career, we've tended to be best prepared for the pandemic we've just had and not necessarily the one we get next. So the important distinction here is between those countries that were prepared for a SARS-like epidemic, and those are particularly mm. the ones in Asia and Oceania who were 
most affected by SARS and we're very concerned about it. In Europe and North America, we've most recently, in the last couple of decades, had a focus on pandemic influenza. And of course, that was given a boost by the swine flu pandemic back in 2009, 2010. Pretty mild by pandemic standards, but nonetheless, clearly a warning that pandemic influenza was a reality and possibly a, a more pathogenic form might arise sooner or later. So yes, there is a difference, even in the planning you would do if you were thinking of SARS or you were thinking of flu. The difference is, on the face of it, might be quite small because they're both respiratory pathogens. They transmit in broadly similar ways. So you might expect the focus to be very similar. But actually, it's not. And it's that point you raised. It's the point about test and trace, tracking infections, tracking the course of outbreaks, isolating people when you think they might be infectious and so on. That worked very well for SARS. And there's a reason why it worked, which is that most transmission of the SARS virus happens after people start mm -hmm. showing symptoms. That's crucial. That means if you can catch them early enough, you can isolate them and stop the spread. Now, if you're thinking about flu, well, that's not the case at all. I mean, the vast majority of flu cases are so mild that most of us don't even, not even sure whether we have it or not. Very, very difficult to control the flu pandemic through that way. So the countries that were thinking about SARS were more inclined to go for this case detection, test and trace sort of approach from the outset, mm -hmm. whereas the countries that were thinking more about flu, which is Europe and North America in particular, were not. They were thinking all the time in terms of social distancing. They weren't thinking in terms of lockdown because for flu, the social distancing wouldn't have to be so severe, but they were thinking in, in those terms, yes. Now, you talk about sort of a point of no return, right? So in strategy, we have to take into consideration circumstances. And in the countries that were pretty successful at suppressing the disease early in 2020, South Korea, Taiwan, Australia, New Zealand, I mean, these were countries that were able to impose border controls prior to any widespread outbreak. Now, England is, is an island too, right? So, you know, England could presumably have imposed border controls. But I think you argue that there's a point beyond which it's too late, right? And that's simply not going to work. So you were trying to raise the alarms fairly early in the process. And there are a number of people who are trying to raise the alarms fairly early in the process. Could the widespread dissemination of SARS-CoV-2 in the UK have been prevented if there had been kind of earlier action that took place? Or was it inevitable that the virus would diffuse widely within the UK? My best estimate, or guess if you prefer, based on the evidence I've seen, is that the latest the UK could have gone down this closed borders route and hopefully, if not prevented, at least delayed a uh, significant wave of the coronavirus, the new coronavirus, was sometime mid to late February 2020. We know now, particularly from the genome sequencing studies, that the UK, British Isles, imported thousands of cases, mostly actually from other European countries, not directly from China. We got them from other European countries and that in that late February period. So that was probably the sometime during that month was the last time we could have done that. But New Zealand, if you remember, didn't actually close its borders until well into March and didn't go into a lockdown to try and eliminate infection, what there was in New Zealand, until actually after the UK mm -hmm. did. But the difference was, of course, that New Zealand didn't have an established epidemic by then. New Zealand is not actually that well connected to the European countries that turned out to be the hub of infection in those early months. And so it got away with it for longer. So even though, actually, you could argue that New Zealand responded slower than the US mm -hmm. and Okay. It was still able, in its unique situation, to close its borders, not exactly sit out the pandemic, but come pretty close to it. But no, I don't think we had the option of that, certainly not in March and possibly not from the middle of February onwards. So a lot of the heterogeneity and outcomes depended in part on the degree to which you had sort of an initial infectious load, right? I think in Scandinavia, a lot of people were pointing to differences between Sweden and Norway, let's say. And I think some people argued that you know, Sweden was more, was hit harder in part because they had more kind of a larger influx of travelers in that period, January and February of 2020. Yes. I mean, I mean, there's been any number of computer simulations of how a new virus might spread about the world. And unsurprisingly, the biggest predictor of all of what happens in the early stages is international connectivity. So the UK's big Issue there is London, which is a tremendous international travel hub. So we tend to get exposed to new viruses very quickly. 
Finland, for example, in Scandinavia, Norway, less so. I mean, they absolutely have travel hubs, but they're less connected than the UK. Even within the UK, there's a difference. So swine flu back in 2009, it got into England, the London area in particular, a few weeks earlier than it got to Scotland. We're not quite so well connected there as the, as the southern part of the British Isles. So it took a while to get there. So yes, we know that that level of international connectivity is a key driver to the early course of a pandemic. Mm-hmm. Now, could you talk a bit of, so how do experts like yourself interact with policymakers? In the book, you know, you cite this phrase, right? Advisors advise and, and ministers decide, right? So is there, at least in theory, a separation between kind of what the scientists can say and, and what the deciders decide? It seemed like that boundary got blurred a little bit. I mean, in the United States, I think the boundary was blurred a lot. But what is sort of the division of labor between, you know, what the scientists do or the public health folks do on the academic side and then the folks inside of government do? Well, my own first involvement for for this virus in particular was actually cold calling the chief medical officer of Scotland. Sure, was quite surprised to hear from me, but I hadn't seen what I thought in uh, this is mid-January, January the 21st. I didn't think there was enough attention being paid to potential threat. So I was contacting the chief medical officer to try and hurry the process of response along. Not, I have to say, with particular success. But, uh, I did at least get it on record that I was very concerned about this. And we laid out, me and a few colleagues, what we thought was going to happen over the next couple of months. Well, the details are set out there in the book, but it was pretty accurate. Uh, so that this wasn't people inventing problems that were not actually going mm-hmm. to pass. I mean, this was pretty accurate. But from that month onwards, I became, again, because I'd been it in the past as well, part of the UK scientific advisory system. And as you say, there is this tension between advisors advising and policymakers making policy. The mantra in the UK, which I think was even more controversial, I don't know if you had it in the US, was that the ministers were following the science. Well, that was always going to be a little bit difficult to hold on to when we're dealing with a fast-moving situation created by an unknown, previously unknown virus that we're learning about all the time. And I remember having a conversation with a very senior minister in Scotland saying, look, you know, we're giving our advice now based on the information we have, but there's still lots of unknowns. We're waiting for data to come in. It could be that our advice will change. And the minister, to give him credit, totally got this. He understood that this would be the case. But he also said, in return, I understand his point of view, that that would be very difficult for policymakers because they might be seen as U-turning or backtracking yeah. all things that are politically not very desirable. So I think there is this tension between the government wanting to decide on a course of action, or indeed sometimes a course of inaction, and what scientists are advising them based on a changing evidence base. Well, I mean, science in general is, good science is very conservative. Right. You know, you don't want to make any kind of conclusions without convincing evidence, but policymakers need to make decisions without convincing evidence. Right. Does that necessarily mean that the policymakers are going to fly blind to some degree? Can scientists present information with, you know, big fat confidence intervals when you're dealing with the world of uncertainty? Should scientists kind of hold back from making claims or can they kind of make provisional claims and be prepared to you know, reverse them as more information comes in? Well, you mentioned confidence limits there. So let's use that as an illustration. In a completely different epidemic in the UK, many years ago, in the early 2000s, we had an outbreak of the livestock disease, foot and mouth mm-hmm. disease. It was very serious and caused uh, immense upheaval, not just in agriculture, but in wider society too. And I remember I was advising government again there and I was talking to a senior government official And I said, well, we detected this pattern in the data, but we weren't confident about the pattern. It hadn't reached 95% level of confidence, the standard scientific level of confidence. And the government official looked at me and said, Mark, I haven't got time to wait until you're 95% confident. Are you 51% confident? Yeah. That would do for me. Right. And and I've always, ever since then, thought that extra 44% was the gray area between Mm. science and policy. Policy has to be made in that gray area. I completely accept it. But you're right. Many scientists are uncomfortable giving advice when the evidence is far from certain. Well, when you make these forecasts and you talk a bit about the role of modeling, right? And so a lot of what epidemiologists do is they do these models, right? And they make a, you have to make a whole bunch of assumptions, right? And so 
it's oftentimes the the worst case scenarios that kind of get the most attention, right? And so, you know, to what extent did the way in which those worst case scenarios get presented to policymakers and to the general public wind up influencing the ultimate policy outcomes? If you presented sort of the most likely scenario and then sort of a, you know, a range and people understood that and the media presented that, would we have kind of made different decisions? I mean, they say, you know, if it bleeds, it leads. Is there something, is there a communication problem, you know, where the scientists get this information filtered through the media or filtered through politicians, which then get filtered through the media? I think there's a huge communication issue. So the reasonable worst case scenario, as it's called, which isn't always to do with models in epidemiology or finance or anywhere else, but it certainly can be, is a perfectly sensible planning tool. It boils down to hope for the best, but plan for the worst. So it Mm -hmm. is the worst we can reasonably expect. That's the idea. But it is also true, just as you said, that the media often cannot resist latching onto this as some sort of prediction. It's not a prediction because it's not the most likely thing that you think is going to happen but it's not so unlikely you can't rule it out. If it did happen, you'd be surprised, unpleasantly so, but not off the scale surprised. That said, and I've given this in, already in evidence to the inquiries that are going on in the UK about our response to COVID-19, that I think we all have to think harder, epidemiologists, economists, everyone else, about exactly how we construct these worst case scenarios and how we communicate them. And I can give you one example that happened early on in the UK's story in this, and I know it had influence in the US too, when government was presented with actually a single modeled scenario that compared implementing a lockdown in the very near future, this was in March 2020, with a counterfactual scenario, an alternative scenario. And that alternative scenario was what would happen if we did absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. Now, let's just think about that for a moment. The pandemic is raging through the population. Thousands, tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of people are dying. Government doesn't do anything, and we all carry on as normal. This is not a reasonable worst-case scenario. This is a completely unrealistic Mm -hmm. worst-case scenario. But that was used, certainly by the media and politicians, to justify in the UK the implementation of that first lockdown, because if we didn't, according to that comparison, an enormous number of people would die. But it was never realistic. Well, it seems like the worst case scenario in that was presented by these epidemiologists became part of the discussion, but there didn't seem to be any worst case scenario spelled out for the consequences of the policies. I didn't hear from any economists who were saying, hey, here's the worst case scenario of lockdown, right, in terms of, you know, inflation and unemployment and education loss and and so forth. I mean, if we had to compare worst case scenarios of of those two alternatives, then maybe, you know, we might have had a slightly different policy. But why was there sort of silence on the other side? Well, you're quite right. I mean, the way I put this actually in a select committee hearing at the UK Parliament was, I think our response has been driven too much by epidemiology. And I'm an epidemiologist. Mm. So I completely agree with your comment. The reason why we didn't have that input, again, you've already said it, is because the advisory system for dealing with this kind of emergency, in this case, a health emergency, was packed with public health specialists and clinicians whose training, all of our training in this field is, is about saving lives or reducing the burden of illness. That's what we're trained to think about. So when I've taught pandemic response, to my students, certainly, uh, you know, the sort of undergraduate level courses, I'm not teaching them about these trade-offs. The the only trade-off I might introduce into the conversation is the actual monetary cost of the intervention. Mm -hmm. So that the standard health economics cost-effectiveness measures, occasionally we move to cost-benefit measures. But all our training is thinking about the intervention targeted at the disease. We're not thinking about these wider knock-on effects And I don't think in the early stages, very many people were thinking about those. And as you quite rightly say, and I don't know how it was in the US, but I suspect it was similar. There were no economic reasonable worst case projections. There were no reasonable worst case projections for what damage will do to the education of our our children and our young people Mm. or to the mental health of the population. These weren't done. And over the course of pandemic, this was challenged again and again, but we never saw any evidence of this kind of analysis being done. 
Now, public health officials kind of worldwide converged on this notion of lockdown as the proper response. And you mentioned that this term lockdown never appeared in public health discussion prior to 2020. It was never really considered an option. So I'm wondering, first of all, like, why did this become an option? So I guess, number one, you know, why did we gravitate towards that option? When did it become an alternative that was even worthy of consideration? Well, the first part of the answer to that question harks back to what we were talking about, about pandemic preparedness. So here we are, we've, we've had all these assessments, the UK and the US has come out right at the top of the heap for pandemic preparedness, but none of us, any of the countries on the list, as you quite rightly say, it contemplated lockdown. So that immediately tells you our pandemic preparedness planning actually wasn't that good because it didn't even consider an option that we would later embrace right across the whole world. So, wait, so uh, no one ever even thought about, why did, why did nobody ever think about this as, I mean, you can imagine there must be some circumstances where this would, this would make sense. We were focusing on SARS, where, as we've said, you would concentrate on the case detection and the subsequent isolation of cases, and on flu, where you wouldn't need lockdown because the social distancing measures you need are less drastic for flu simply because it's our number or more formally it's basic reproduction number. And incidentally, you and I are not just having an abstract theoretical academic conversation now. This is all going into the new preparedness plans that are being written. So we'll come back to why lockdown was latched onto in a minute, but the genie is now out of the bottle. Lockdown may not have been a public health option in 2020, but it certainly is now. So one of the reasons indeed for writing this book is I think we better take a long, hard, critical look about the evidence, the strengths and weaknesses of the lockdown approach before we wholeheartedly embrace it as part of the next generation of pandemic preparedness plans. I think there's a real big danger there that we'll just jump into lockdown again the next time anything comes along to threaten us. And it, it may not even be the right thing to do then. I'm personally not convinced it was the right thing to do last time around. But you asked why. Why, why did we latch on to it? It started in Wuhan. China, where the novel coronavirus was first reported. And it was part of China's, with the full support of the World Health Organization, attempt to eradicate this new coronavirus, just as they had with SARS back in 2003. So they were trying to replicate, actually, a tremendously successful pandemic response. It stopped potentially very, very serious public health event, and it worked. And then, so they tried the lockdown, and it sort of worked. They did managed to eradicate it from Wuhan, but not before it had already spread, not only further within China, but more widely. And once it was clear that this was no longer geographically isolated virus, my own view is that, well, surely then lockdown comes off the table. I mean, it did make sense when they were first trying to apply it to a limited area for a limited time. But once it's escaped from that containment, it doesn't, to me, immediately suggests that actually lockdown is the right way to proceed now. And even if it is, even if you think there are benefits to lockdown, do not think it's going to anymore eradicate the virus. It's not. It's too late for that. So all lockdown is going to do, and we knew that right from the outset, is simply delay the problem. We're, we're okay, we've we suppressed the spread of the virus, but it's still there. It's not going away. Mm -hmm. It's not going away ever now. So if we come out of lockdown, the virus comes back. So we go back into lockdown. So mm -hmm. then the virus comes down again. And so the cycle goes on. Of course, that's what happened. We went in and out of lockdown all the way through 2020 into 2021. Entirely predictable from the very beginning. Well, now, if the goal was to flatten the curve, let's say, then presumably there should be a menu of public health responses that would flatten this curve. And you could rank order them from, you know, least expensive to most expensive. I mean, did public health officials have at their disposal sort of a menu of curve flattening interventions, right? I mean, you know, it seemed like they were kind of making these things up on the fly, like, well, no more arena concerts. Okay. Well, that, that seems reasonable. <laughs> you know, like let's shut down restaurants. Like, I mean, one would think that we would know enough about how humans interact and a little bit about how diseases spread that we would you know, have a menu to choose from. I mean, were there any simulations done around infectious transmission as a function of these different activities? There were a huge number of those kinds of simulations done, and some of them included particular settings. So 
schools, particularly when you're doing pandemic influenza simulations, workplaces as one as well. So there is some granularity in how we model, how we simulate this. And some of these models are very detailed. They actually Mm -hmm. model us all as individuals moving around between our homes and our workplaces and our universities and our schools. So, I mean, there's incredibly detailed modeling of this, but it's still not granular enough to really say with authority what happens if you, as we did in the UK, if you decide that you should close bars, not at midnight, but at 10 in the evening. I mean, what difference is that supposed to make? Well, in in Boston, they left the bars open and closed the schools. That's an interesting priority. (laughs) I wasn't sure exactly what the... How that worked. Yeah. So there the wasn't the granularity to that. And that, that, that's fine. I mean, I mean, you, you can't produce a perfect model. And remember, we don't have really precise data on transmission rates in different settings to feed into these sorts of simulations. So they're always going to be based on assumptions anyway. So, you know, you can only go so far with the granularity, uh, but then it is up to public health judgment. So what we need then is not models. We need data. We need, okay, what is the evidence of where people are getting infected? Is it in in pubs? Is it in supermarkets? Is it on public transport? And that was done to some degree. The epidemiologists did the very best they could to try and work out where the risk uh, factors were. But of course, we were doing this against a background of a world that was mostly in lockdown. So it was a very artificial. But but then why not why not run experiments? Right, bring people in the lab. I mean, in finance, what we have is you know we have these elaborate spreadsheets, and then when new information comes in, we just change the information in one cell, and then we watch how it spreads through the whole valuation model. So you know, as we learned, oh okay, you know, droplets versus vapor, okay, adjust that, and then you know, infectiousness, of young people, old people, and then you know, distance and number of people, and you just kind of tweak the dials, and then presumably that would you know change the rank ordering of of the different policy interventions, right? So, yeah, I mean, but that, that, that was done. I mean, I mean, so so you know, the new information coming in wasn't ignored. It was assimilated into the simulations as best you can do. But as I say, the granularity wasn't there to make these very very fine scale decisions. One of the odd things about that, and again, I don't know if this was happening in the US, but it certainly was in the UK, is some of these things about, for example, how long the queue outside a takeaway could be, were decided at ministerial level. Yeah. And that's personally not what I want my politicians to be thinking about in times of emergency. And I wonder, interesting to know what your listeners think of this, whether there's an analogy with wars, which is on everyone's mind at the moment. But the politicians don't go out on the battlefield and direct the group. That's not their role. And yet there they were making these really quite fine-tuned public health decisions on the basis of limited uh, actual evidence. Surely those are the things, that's what your public health agencies are for. Well, I think things are flipped. I mean, I think you're absolutely right. They should be focused on the strategy and not the tactics. And once they decide, okay, here's an acceptable cost per infection, right, prevention, then leave it to the public health. In other words, if you decide how much you're willing to spend, decide what your priorities are, and then the mechanics of that can be delegated down to the public health folks. But it seems like politicians were focused on the tactics and then when it came to strategy, they kind of said, here, you know, let's not think about that. So was it simply they were focused on tactics because they didn't really want to deal with strategy? And so they'd kind of hope that the public health people would come up with a strategy and, and then they would be off the hook? So they did, in the UK, they did set policy goals. And well, there were two. One obviously was saving lives. although That's a more slippery one than it sounds. But the other one they uh, they they absolutely emphasized was not letting our National Health Service be yeah. overwhelmed. So, so there were policy goals, but no, they weren't thinking about what you and I might refer to as strategy. And my belief is, having spoken to many politicians, both during and after events, they did not understand what they were facing. So when we went into that first lockdown in the UK in March 2020, we did so partly on the understanding that was the only alternative to hundreds of thousands of people dying, which it absolutely wasn't, but also that this was a temporary measure. The sort of timescale being talked about was six weeks. And if we all knuckled down and got on with it and sat this out, the tough though it would be, that would be in some way the end of the crisis. Six weeks. This was extraordinarily naive and completely Mm -hmm. contrary to what me and many other epidemiologists were expecting. I was saying back in February, this was going to last at least two years. Actually turned out not to be a bad prediction. 
But it wasn't just our voices that the politicians were hearing. They were hearing an awful lot of other commentators from a whole wealth of other disciplines, including actually some economists, who backed this up. And so the actual clear signal, the clear epidemiological understanding, I think, got drowned out in a cacophony of dissenting voices. And this message that we just had to lock down for a few weeks and the problem would be over got ingrained in politicians' minds and therefore into policy. Well, I want to get back to this idea that you know you need to flatten the curve in order to reduce the strain on the on the healthcare system, right? And so this clearly was an objective. They wanted to prevent the NHS from being overwhelmed. And so this kind of puzzled me because, you know, if in operations, when we want to deal with capacity constraints, we increase the capacity constraints, you know, like we say, okay, well, if we're worried about being overwhelmed, we expand capacity. So in the United States, there didn't seem to be any investment at all in increasing our capacity, right? Which would be the logical response. I mean, you'd compare at least the cost of increasing capacity versus the reduction in value, keeping the numbers low. In fact, I, I recall a number of my friends who worked in healthcare who were on furlough throughout 2020 because there was nobody in the hospital. And then in other countries where they didn't have any capacity at all, you know, then presumably they would have to shut the disease level down to zero because they're, they didn't have any of these beds and they went to sort of, you know, less aggressive remedies. So in India, instead of, you know, worrying about intensive care, they said, okay, we'll use oxygen tanks or BPAPs or something like that. So why didn't the NHS think in terms of either increasing capacity or looking at sort of lower cost, less aggressive ways of dealing with the problems? And, and I guess another question is, did we actually have, and I've always been puzzled by this, did we have any evidence that hospitalization really made much of a difference, right? So my understanding is that with ventilators, the difference between the mortality rates of people on ventilators and people who didn't have access to ventilators was relatively small, and it involved an enormous amount of resources. Well, you're, you're right about the ventilators, and I think much less emphasis was put on those after the first wave. But I remember the clinicians are still learning how to deal with this disease, and they learned very quickly and they learned very well. So in Scotland, the case fatality rate for hospitalized patients was over 30% at the beginning of the first wave mm -hmm. and not much over 10% by the end of it. So our clinicians got an awful lot better at treating this. And you're right, it turns out we did some work on this very early during that first wave that actually within the healthcare system, numerically, the biggest saver of lives for people who wouldn't actually have recovered anyway was oxygen. And that was numerically much more important than putting people- And that could be done through outpatient, right? Well, it can be done at home if you have the equipment. Yeah. The other thing it can be done, by the way, is this was in 2020, and you referred to the terrible scenes in India in 2021, where there was a severe oxygen shortage in, in their Delta coronavirus wave. So in our own advice, mine and colleagues here in Edinburgh to countries overseas was not to invest in increased intensive care capacity, even some places it didn't really exist, as you quite rightly say, but to invest in oxygen. And that was an affordable, for many countries, that was an affordable intervention. So that's, I think, an example of exporting our sort of instinctive Western biases to try and save the very, very sickest patients at the expense of investing and saving the vast majority who actually don't need intensive care, but they do need oxygen. There's a much bigger number of patients. So I think we got it wrong there. We invested in the capacity in the UK, and also we saw it in China, building the extra hospital beds. but we kind of forgot about the fact we'd need the nurses and the doctors and all mm -hmm. the support staff to look after this. So I don't know that we ever really had the capacity to deal with a bigger event. But that could be retraining. I mean, we had a lot of unemployed waiters and waitresses and, you know, other folks that, that could, I mean, you don't need to have a four-year MD degree to, you know, turn people over in bed and stuff like that, right? Why not just do, I mean, when I think about World War II, I mean, we, we would give people 90 days of training and then throw them into battle, right? And then, you know, we, we would start cranking out planes in a matter of, of weeks, right? So why couldn't we do that kind of response? I mean, if we thought of, if we're willing to invest these kinds of resources on lockdown, why wouldn't we say, okay, you know, we're at war here. Let's invest some real resources in, you know, building out this capacity, this healthcare capacity, so that we don't have to turn the whole world upside down to keep the 
number of ill people below this this threshold. We can increase the threshold and therefore kind of you know move this more quickly along. Well, I have some sympathy with what you're saying, but those sorts of decisions, you know, the decision how you build capacity very, very quickly would have to be an awful lot quicker than 90 days during that first wave. Those really ought to be made as part of our pandemic preparedness planning and not on the hoof in the middle of an emergency. Remember, in the early cases, the number of uh, fatalities was doubling every three or four days. It really doesn't take long before you're overwhelmed if, in your hospitals if the, the virus yeah. is fast. So I think you have to have plan to do all this before it. If one lesson, one of many lessons that should be learned from this is making up these sort of responses on the hoof mm -hmm. is so far suboptimal that we should really make some effort not to be put in this position again, which is a point you were making to me right at the beginning of this conversation, and I completely agree with it. Now, another thing that you emphasize in the book is that the policy response failed to acknowledge the radical differences in vulnerability across elements of the population. You mentioned that you know our response to HIV was not to ban sex. We said we can do something that's a little more precise. And you use this term uh, precision, as it precision epidemiology. I forget the exact term you used, but it, it precision public health. Precision precision public, public health, right? And so you know we know about precision warfare, right? Where, you know, you don't just kind of carpet bomb the entire country if you can sort of drop a missile down the air shaft of the Minister of Defense. So, you know, why did we think that being more precise in our interventions was was not was not an option? And, you know, why did we think that it was a bad idea to tell people about these radical differences in vulnerability? Very good question. So let's put some numbers on this. We knew from very early stages of COVID-19 that the likelihood of dying from a coronavirus infection in a person over 75 was 10,000 times higher than a child of 15 or under. I mean, that really is enormous difference. And what that immediately tells you, strip away all the political arguments, all the scaremonger that was going on. What that immediately tells is you do need a response that pays attention to those very vulnerable people and by default, less attention to those who really are at very little danger from this virus. And no, we never properly cottoned on to this. Um, we were talking earlier about the demand for hospital care and particularly the high-end care, whether it's oxygen or intensive care units. Well, by far the bulk, not the only, but by far the bulk of the people who are going into that were in known categories of vulnerability. They were elderly, they were frail, they were infirm, they had comorbidities. And we identified these people with great precision from really quite early on, certainly the first few months of the pandemic. And yet we never properly focused attention on, well, these are the people at risk. How do we stop them getting infected? And there was this rather naive argument that, well, doesn't lockdown protect everybody? Well, it's true to a degree, but it demonstrably doesn't protect all of those vulnerable people. I can give you a statistic from Scotland, because we did some work on this, that during the first wave of the people who died, up to three quarters of them, three quarters, acquired those infections that killed them during lockdown. Lockdown didn't save these people. So whether you're for or against lockdown or somewhere on the fence, Clearly, we needed other strategies, ones that did a better job of protecting the people who were most vulnerable. And because we were so focused on lockdown, and we might get on to the debates we had in the UK and the US about that, because we were so focused on it, we seem to ignore the blindingly obvious. There's a small subset of the community here that is really in danger from this virus, and they need special measures to protect them. Now, there's a tool available on it. I forget which. It's a UK website. I taught a course on the coronavirus this past spring at Stanford, and, and I, there's a tool that I, I distributed to my students where you can input a number of characteristics, your age and other health characteristics, and get some kind of you know risk metric. And But I don't think that this tool was available in 2020, even though I think most of the data that was needed for this tool was already available in early of 2020. So, you know, why weren't public health officials being more proactive in terms of communicating the disparities in risk to, to folks 
because this, this would be a really important piece of information for an individual to know what one's vulnerability is. I mean, it seemed like there's a bit of a, a paternalistic view that, you know, we can't really trust people. And if they find out that they're at low risk, then they'll behave recklessly and endanger the folks who are in danger. So I think you're right. There was an unwillingness on behalf of government, certainly, to encourage us to manage our own risk and manage the risk of the people around it. And you're quite right. To do that effectively, you, I, and everybody else needs accurate information. We didn't get that. And to give you a particularly blatant example from the UK, and this actually came out of originally out of one of the scientific advisory groups in the early stages, they put this in their minutes. They said, we are concerned that, I'm not quoting verbatim, but it's, it's of this order. We are concerned that a significant portion of the population might not comply with lockdown measures because they perceive themselves to be at low risk, brackets, which they are at low risk. Mm. Therefore, the government should try and, I didn't say induce fear, but that's how it was interpreted in this population in order to ensure their compliance with lockdown. I mean, that's extraordinary. I mean, that goes against every principle of public health messaging I, I was ever taught. So we actually consciously feed people or allow people anyway to have a misperception of the mm -hmm. risks to them and, and others in order to try and encourage their compliance with this very, very drastic intervention. I always was and I remain very uncomfortable with that approach. Well, so I teach a course in financial engineering and these are students who are, many of them are PhDs in quantitative fields. They're exceptionally good at dealing with numbers and probabilities. They're all going to go work for hedge funds. And in the spring of 21, early 21, I, I did a survey in this class where I asked them what they thought the risk of dying was contingent on infection for, say, a 30-year-old woman with no comorbidities. And they were off by a factor of 100,000. And I thought, this is wild. You know, I've got people who are, you know, super, super educated, right? Quantitative geniuses with PhDs and they're just so wildly off. I mean, it's like thinking you're going to get eaten by a shark when you go into the ocean. Now, did this affect their daily lives? Did they make decisions any different as a result of this? I don't know, but it can't but have had some kind of psychological impact on people. So, I mean, do you actually think, I mean, if, if we were to tell people, listen, you know, 80% of you really don't have to anything to worry about, that that would have resulted in kind of a, a lack of care for the people who were truly vulnerable. I mean, the disparities you're talking about, they're comparable to the disparities between somebody who has a severe peanut allergy and someone who doesn't. I mean, when we don't have a peanut allergy, we don't worry about eating peanuts, but that doesn't mean that we're going to just blatantly scatter peanuts around when we encounter someone who, who has one of these allergies. I think we're, most of us would be pretty careful and, and try to you know safeguard that person. Yeah. So to pursue the peanut analogy, None of us are at zero risk from peanuts. Mm -hmm. We could choke on them, but it's a risk that most of us are quite happy to manage. As you say, there's a small minority that where the risks are much greater because of allergies. So the studies that were done, the behavioral science studies done in the UK were very clear on this point, that people were willing to put up with restrictions of one form or another on their own activities and behavior in order to protect others. So although I'm not a behavioral scientist and I can't point you to the definitive study, my impression is that the governments needn't have worried, that, that people were perfectly capable of understanding, well, I'm not at risk, but my elderly relative might be. I'm not at risk, but if I go to hospital, I have to go to hospital, I, I, there'll be patients I might put at risk. And so on. I, I think people were entirely capable of understanding that. What do they need then to act on that information? Well, first of all, as we've just been discussing, they need an accurate, a true understanding of what risks they face and what the people around them face. And that includes details of how this virus is transmitted so they can manage that. And the other thing that would be really useful for all of us from the outset was to know our infection status. And mm -hmm. you mentioned HIV AIDS earlier. Of course, that was a key plank to HIV AIDS prevention is know your status. Well, we need to know our coronavirus status. Mm -hmm. Very, very difficult to do that with the diagnostic tests, the RT-PCR tests that we were relying on for the early months of the pandemic, because they're just a bit slow and cumbersome. I mean, it could be done, but it's logistically extremely difficult. But perfectly possible with those point-of-care diagnostic tests, the lateral mm -hmm. flow that came along later, 
I still do not understand why we were so slow to pursue the development of the lateral flows. And once we had them, so slow to roll them out. So we started rolling them out in late 2020 in the UK, but we went through two lockdowns before these tests were given mm. to basically the whole population in Scotland and England. It was free that we could use them. And then suddenly we could all do it. We could assess our own status. So every time I went to see an elderly relative or went to some uh, gathering or something, I would test myself to make sure I wasn't positive, do it several days. And almost the majority of the population were doing exactly the same thing. So given the tools and given the knowledge, yes, we can manage our own risk, but we were not given that option in the early days of 2020 and beyond. So, I mean, it seems like there's a small subset of the population that's in very big danger. Let's call it less than 10%. And at any given time, there may have been one or 2% of the population that was infectious. And so it seems like the public policy objective should have been, how do we keep the 1% away from the 10%, right? And so, first of all, you need to know who the 10% are, and then you need to know who the 1% are. And as long as everybody knows who the 1% and the 10% are, then they just kind of stay away from each other, right? You make it sound very simple, but broadly speaking, yes, that's right. So uh, then why, why did, I mean, some people would argue that you know, keeping those vulnerable people safe would be too expensive and impractical, right? I mean, you know, you'd have to build a sort of plastic bubble around them and that's just unrealistic. And so we just need to keep the disease down. So what would have, what, how would we have implemented a policy where we kept people, say, in care homes safe and, and how much would it have cost relative to what we ultimately wound up spending on lockdowns? And by spending, I think one of the things, and as an economist, there's, you know, on budget and off budget. And it seems like oftentimes policymakers focus on the, the on budget, like, do they have to write a check? And, you know, the costs that either are borne by the private sector, I mean, certainly in the United States, I think if you questioned some of these public policy or costs that are borne by the next administration, you know, two, three years down the road, those are kind of invisible as well. But what would have been, you know, what would have been a practical way to kind of protect the most vulnerable? Well, it comes down to what we were just saying, partly about testing, but also partly about making contact safe. And we did know how the latter to make the contact safe. We need a lot about that from very early on. So it was recognized in the UK, certainly in hospitals, that there was the possibility of hospital mm -hmm. transmission, which, which there was, and that was no surprise given the nature of the virus. And a lot of security, biosecurity measures were put in place to try and protect staff and patients. That wasn't extended to care homes where a lot of vulnerable people live, and it wasn't extended to vulnerable people in the community. So first question is, why not? That's an obvious thing to do. Why not? And the testing follows that. So that again, from very early on, healthcare workers, particularly in hospital settings, were prioritized for testing. So why not the workers and indeed visitors mm -hmm. to care homes and so on into the community? What that does require, and you're right about the direct costs, is a very rapid scaling up of the, the methods we need, the tools we need in order to deliver both COVID safe interactions and testing capability, it all could have been done logistically far, far faster than it was. But again, I think we come back to this idea, the government kept thinking the problem was going to go away. And there were some in the scientific community yeah. that were supporting that argument. So, you know, they did make investments in, you know, in testing particularly and in biosecurity for care homes and so on. But they were trivial compared with the overall costs of the pandemic. So in the UK, even in the first year, we borrowed something like three or 400 billion pounds. And that, most of that was to cover things like the furlough scheme, which was a consequence of lockdown, was basically to pay for lockdown measures. Mm -hmm. It was a tiny proportion of that amount that we invested in rolling out testing or biosecurity for care homes or even protection against infection in hospitals, tiny amount. So when you just look at where we spent the money, we put it almost all in this lockdown basket and very, very little of it in the alternatives to lockdown. Very strange decision from my point of view. You use this term bio shielding, I think is the term you use. Biosecurity. Biosecurity. Bio so, so this is really about, you know, people who have vulnerable folks in their homes, right? They need to sort of create something. I mean, first of all, there's care homes, right? That's one area where you know, you can institutionally put in place some 
fairly strict protections. You mentioned that very little was actually spent on this, right? And that, you know, that the resources, if there had been even small amounts of resources had been deployed in this direction, it would have saved a number of lives. But then also kind of in the home. So people would need to understand what it means to be, you know, shields, right? What it means if you have an elderly person in your home or a vulnerable person, like, you know, what it is that, that you have to do, right? And what is your duty and obligation as opposed to someone who doesn't have a vulnerable person in their home? Yeah. So my model of this is a personal level for, is from my own family. And I describe this situation in the book. As early as February 2020, my sister, who is my mother's, it's called an informal carer in the UK system, but he's a, her main contact and her main carer, realized exactly all that, that in order to keep my mother safe, well, she could isolate my mother. You know, my mother did need some help. So she would have to interact with my mother, but therefore she had to keep herself safe in order to do that. And she wasn't given any help in this at all. She wasn't given access to free PPE mm. the, or medical grade masks, for example, or provided with you know, sanitation equipment or the house wasn't provided with ventilation. Any, none of that was offered. And particularly, she wasn't offered testing. Mm. So while we were, for the same reason, effectively offering our healthcare workers testing on a regular basis, we weren't rolling that out into all the other people who come between that vulnerable minority and the virus circulating in the community and not only needed, but also wanted to do everything they could to keep themselves and the people they were caring for safe. So I think that was a tremendous missed opportunity. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons we didn't do it, by the way, is the, the models we talked about earlier simply weren't set up to look at the impact of this sort of intervention. My group had to produce an ad hoc model you know, which went through all the peer review and the publishing things, but, but to show how well this would work. But we still never embraced it in the UK. Yeah, so in the United States, when we rolled out these free rapid testing kits, you know, they were sent to anybody who wanted them indiscriminately. And it wasn't like, oh, I'm a registered bioshielder, and so presumably I should get a massive pile of these, whereas someone else who's not and has no intention of interacting with vulnerable people like, they don't really need these kits. So, you know, I think if the resources had been redistributed in a more concentrated, precision way, it could have gotten a much bigger bang for the buck. Well, indeed. But to get to that point, the policymakers have to understand that this is not a problem that was going away anytime soon. Mm -hmm. And they also have to understand, the point you raised earlier, that the lockdown strategy was going to cause an enormous amount of knock-on harm. Mm -hmm. we're, we're all seeing that materialize now, aren't we? But I don't think they probably got that in the early yeah. stage. Well, you refer to that as the optimism bias. And then I was, when I first read that, I was a little puzzled because I thought, wow, how can you go back and look at what happened and say that people were overly optimistic, right? Everybody seemed, you know, overly cautious. But I think you're pointing out to this idea that the politicians, I probably wouldn't have called it an optimism bias. I would have called it like a, you know, a very, very high discount rate in the sense that, you know, we're just going to act in the short run and we're not going to think too much about what's going to happen downstream. We'll, we'll worry about that later in the hopes that we don't have anything to deal with. But if we do have something to deal with, then we'll deal with it then. I mean, is it really just short-sightedness or, you know, was it really, you know, optimism? I think it was in the UK, we call it boosterism in honor of mm. our, our ex-prime minister, but ex-prime minister, but two now. I uh, know. I think there was that. Remember, Boris Johnson was doing this on public health advice. The early public health response to this was advice to the population to wash their hands extra carefully while singing the first verse of happy birthday to you. Sure, we did it long enough. I mean, that was our response to this mm -hmm. pandemic. I mean, it, you couldn't make it up now looking back on it. And yet they thought that was enough, or they hoped mm -hmm. anyway it would be enough. So if you don't want to call that optimism, bias, and short-sightedness, I don't, I don't mind. But it was a completely inadequate response. So I characterize the UK's response, and indeed much of the world's response, as first we underreacted, the washing hands phase, and then we overreacted, the lockdown for everybody phase. Or if you're less charitable about it, first we dithered, then we panicked. And I think that's a fair summary of what happened. And it seems like the World Health Organization you know, did the same thing, right? So it wasn't just the UK government or the US government. I mean, the World Health Organization also went through that process of underestimation and then overreaction, right? Yes. It's 
probably more complicated with the World Health Organization because of necessity, it's a political body. So it has to give advice and take actions that it thinks will be acceptable to its member states. Even the World Health Organization calls February 2020 the lost month, when if everyone had properly appreciated what was coming, and as I come back to me, what me and many colleagues in the UK, in the US, in Europe and elsewhere knew was coming, and we properly asked countries, told countries that needed to prepare for this, then all these systems that you and I have been talking about for the last half hour or so could have been set up in advance or could at least mm -hmm. been consideration in advance. But really not much happened between the virus becoming public knowledge around about New Year 2020 and most of us going into lockdown sometime in March of the same year. There wasn't a lot done during that period mm -hmm. and it needed to be done then. Now, here in the US, I think there was a perception that there existed a consensus among public health officials, among epidemiologists, among the scientists, right? And that's why we said, you know, follow the science. The public conversation was very, was very unproductive. Was the conversation among epidemiologists equally unproductive? You said earlier that science was conservative. And one of the reasons is that where we form a consensus, it takes us ages mm -hmm. to change our minds. It does happen. Science moves on, moves forward. But it doesn't happen just because a single scientist publishes a single study contradicting the accepted consensus, and then we all suddenly change our minds and run off in a different direction. It's a much slower process. And for most of the time, most of my career, actually that's worked pretty well. I get frustrated when ideas are slow to change, but they do change. But in a, an emergency situation, it's nowhere near fast enough. So one thing I have learned about this is on the occasions when I was right, scientifically, the many occasions when I was wrong, like everyone else, but on the occasions when I was right, that wasn't enough to be right. I had to persuade my peers, my fellow scientists and scientific advisors, that this was the way forward. So a good example of that is the reopening of schools in the UK. I was convinced that schools could safely be reopened from very early on, but it took months to win that argument. And while those months ticked over, schools remained closed. And I'm still conflicted as to what I think about that. Of course, no one should reopen schools on the, on the basis of one or a handful of scientists say so when the consensus doesn't agree with it. But the consensus on that occasion was wrong. So mm -hmm. why didn't it agree with it? Why was it so slow to change its mind? And as I say, in normal times, that delay would not be remarkable. But in an emergent situation like this, that delay can be disastrous. So we've got to find a way of shifting consensus faster when the consensus needs to be shifted. I don't have any easy answers to that, but we need to find one. So do we need to, first of all, rethink how we prepare for these events? And secondly, do we need to kind of reallocate our research time and money? So I think there are lessons to be learned at every single scale, all the way from the logistics of getting PPE into hospitals and care homes quicker to those big strategy questions that we were discussing earlier and what we were saying just now about the shifting of consensus. I think it's very hard to pin the failings of the pandemic response in the US and the UK and elsewhere on a single section of that overall response community, as it were. It's not just the scientist's fault. It's not just the advisor's fault. It's not just the civil service fault, the politician's fault. It's not just the healthcare worker's fault. All of us were at fault in some ways. So I, I describe that as a system failure. A system was challenged with this particular event, which remember, wasn't that different from what we planned for. Mm -hmm. It wasn't massively different from pandemic influenza, but it was a different enough that it flew our system, through our system into complete disarray. And we ended up with these bizarre solutions and these bizarre actions that I constitute in my book as the world going mad. So I do think it's a system failure. And Yes, the way to deal with the system failure is to think of a new system. So I think there are short-term lessons to be learned, but I think there are also much deeper lessons about how we respond to this kind of emergency, perhaps other kind of emergencies more generally, so that we don't get a situation where the countries we think are the best prepared in the world end up being the worst affected. So somebody will write a history, I think, at some point of the entire experience. But they'll draw heavily on your book, I think, because you were there in the trenches and you had visibility into what was happening behind the scenes. So I highly recommend everybody check out this book. The year the world went mad. Thank you so much, Mark.
Thanks very much. It's been a pleasure talking to you. This is Unsiloed, brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. 